Hello, my name is Roxana Moran from Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And I am so excited this morning because we're about to hear the results of Orbiter 2, the long awaited study led by Rachel Alamey, for who's from uh, Oxford, uh, Oxford originally, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, Imperial College, and uh, Chris Rajkumar. Uh, who will be presenting it. Isn't that exciting? It's very exciting, yeah. How a little amazing bit to have a mentor <laughs> who gives you this opportunity. Incredible. And I'm yeah. certain you've earned it, and it just is wonderful to see. But Thank let's you. begin with the saga of Orbita. It started some years back, the very first randomized clinical trial, sham control in PCI. Unbelievable study that really turned the world upside down, and that was a brave effort by you, Rasha. It's okay, I'm gonna call you guys with your first name. Yeah, of course. of course. Rasha, you really turned the world upside down. Yeah, you know, Roxana, this is actually, this month is the, the, the month that we recruited the first patient. So it's 10 years since we recruited the first patient into Orbiter One, the first placebo-controlled trial in stable coronary artery disease. And as you said, um, it was a roller coaster when we saw those results a few years later. But I guess the lasting message from Orbiter One was that these trials can be done and that they're ethical and feasible and that their results are interesting. And I guess that set the stage for thinking about how we can improve upon Orbiter One and design a new trial. It really was um, an amazing journey because in chronic coronary syndromes, the role of PCI came into question. Like, it is, does PCI have a role? And then, what were you thinking when you were designing Orbiter 2? Why Orbiter 2? What yeah. was the purpose of it? Yeah, so, I mean, you're quite right. The fallout after Orbiter 1 was what is the place of angioplasty? If it's purported really to be there for symptom relief, we had the results of courage, and of course, in the years that came, we got ischemia. And people started to think, well, even for symptom relief, the benefit in Orbiter 1 didn't seem to be what we expected in a blinded trial. But I guess there had been many conversations about the limitations of Orbiter, and there were some limitations because it was the first of its kind. But I had always felt that in designing Orbiter, what we were trying to do was match the guidelines. And the guidelines had told us that patients should be on at least two antianginal agents before we consider angioplasty as an add-on procedure to relieve their symptoms. And what I'd seen in Orbiter 1 was a significant proportion of patients improved on those antianginal medications and I'd started to think, well, perhaps actually what happens is your symptoms improve and then any additional benefit of angioplasty is attenuated. So really Orbiter 1, uh, Orbiter one kind of tested the guidelines and Orbiter 2 was there to consider much more widely, does angioplasty work versus placebo? And importantly, does it work in a real world population? Because in the real world, we see that the majority of patients across the world are not on the three level, three units of, or three full dose antianginal agents as they were in Orbiter, they're on far lower doses of antianginals. And so this was a trial to say, how does angioplasty work in relieving symptoms without antianginal medication, but again, in a placebo control setting? And of course, there were other aspects of Orbiter 2 that differed, um, but that was the key difference, the withdrawal of antianginal medication. What an amazing journey to think about that you actually had to do this. So Chris, <laughs> tell us about Orbiter 2. Absolutely. Well, Orbiter 2 is a randomized placebo controlled trial, just like Orbiter 1, um, testing the effect of PCI on stable angina. The key differences are that in Orbiter 2, we've taken patients with both single and multivessel ischemia. Um, and we've uh, followed them up for 12 weeks of follow-up, mm -hmm. uh, which is longer than uh, the six weeks in Orbiter 1. As Rasha said, the key difference in Orbiter 2 is that we intentionally diverge from our clinical guidelines. And we take patients off their antianginal medication so that we can answer that question of how much efficacy does PCI have without that attenuating effect of background antianginal medication? Does PCI truly, mechanistically, treat angina? Other interesting aspects of Orbiter 2 are that we've designed a novel patient-centered clinical endpoint. Our primary endpoint is called the Angina Symptom Score. And this is essentially a composite endpoint of three factors. Patients reported to us every day their symptoms using a dedicated smartphone app that was designed for the trial. The other factors that feed into our primary endpoint are any antianginals that the patients require despite us taking them off. 
and finally any adverse clinical events such as unblinding for intolerable angina, acute coronary syndromes and death. And our primary endpoint is the difference in this daily calculated angina symptom score between the two groups. So fantastic and I think about how difficult it must have been to take patients off anti-anginals knowing they were having daily angina. Absolutely. So were these severely symptomatic patients on multiple an anti-anginal? And how was that? Was that a difficult thing to do? So we took patients who had been referred by a consultant cardiologist for percutaneous coronary intervention to treat their symptoms. And we found that most of our patients referred at that point were taking an average of one full-dose antianginal medication at that time. When you compare that to real-world published data, it's pretty much, pretty much representative of exactly what happens mm -hmm. out there in the real world. Um, patients were happy in the, uh, to, to come off their antianginal medication because there was always the possibility of going back onto medication should they require it. What we wanted to do was ensure that our patients were symptomatic prior to randomization. And in fact, if they weren't symptomatic prior to randomization, they were withdrawn from the trial. So a wonderful way to test the mechanism is PCI treat angina. <laughs> and what did you find? What did we find, exactly. Well, the, the, the primary result of Orbiter 2 is that at 12 weeks follow-up, PCI significantly improved the angina <laughs> symptom scores <laughs> compared to placebo. Um, an so PCI works. PCI worked. Um, we found that um, this difference was actually evident immediately following randomization because we collected that symptom data every single day from our patients. And against the sham. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. By the end of follow-up, patients in the PCI arm had about a three-fold greater likelihood of being free from angina than those in the placebo group. Looking at some of our secondary endpoints, PCI offered about a 60-second larger increment in treadmill exercise time compared to the placebo procedure. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had a range of, um, of endpoints. They showed positivity uh, towards PCI. However, the magnitude was probably smaller than we've seen from previous unblinded clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Again, showing the importance of doing this in, in a placebo-controlled manner. So what's your takeaway? Uh, so our, our, I think our takeaway from this is that, um, excitingly, we have our first placebo-controlled data to tell us that actually putting stents into patients with, coronary, uh, with stable coronary artery disease does improve their symptoms. And I think that's hopefully really important for our community and really important for patients. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we now have uh, uh, patients and their, uh, and their physicians now have a choice of two evidence-based pathways uh, where we can offer patients either uh, an approach of antianginal medications or a antianginal procedure like PCI and obviously those will have pros and cons and patients are all individuals and will have their own preferences. Some may prefer an upfront procedure to avoid long-term medications and some patients will of course prefer to avoid procedures that perhaps they're afraid of. Um, it's nice that we have that option. And the sham patients required more medications than the um, PCI? So that's a really good question. We actually found that there was very little difference in the antianginal use between the two groups. Um, and actually there was no statistical difference between the antianginal um, use between the groups. Our primary endpoint was really driven by a reduction in angina frequency mm -hmm. in the patients randomized to, to PCI. Um, that was where the difference occurred. Well, I'm really glad to see that this study is done, that, <laughs> and, that PCI works uh, for uh, reducing, because this is what we tell our patients. And we, I do believe that it does have incremental benefit on top of medications as well. So now what, Rasha? What's, yeah, well, what's in it for Orbiter 3? Well, there's always another trial. Yes, I I'm think, certain. Yeah, for me, there's a few really important questions that remain. The biggest question is why in both trials did we have very large proportions of patients that remained symptomatic despite successful PCI with near normalization of ischemia and in Orbiter 2 that was 59% of our patients. So the question is why do patients still have chest pain and how do we work out who they might be before we offer them a procedure? And importantly are there other factors at play and how do we understand those factors and how can we treat those factors? So um, you're thinking microvascular. I'm thinking, well, I'm thinking all sorts flow, of things, but I'm not giving it away yet. Don't give it away. Don't give it away. But I think the other key thing that we we can do with the data we already have 
is start to look for predictors of benefit. And now what we have is obviously 301 patients from Orbiter 2, we have the 200 patients from Orbiter 1, there are many plans for secondary analyses and you're going to see lots of my fellows coming and presenting, you know, how do symptoms predict benefit, how does ischemia predict benefit in terms of invasive physiology or the non-invasive tests and importantly what happens when we put all of this patient level data together and we have this 500 patient data set that we can meta-analyse and start to think about the impact of the antiangina medications but also maybe the impact of physiology anatomy and their symptoms on what happened next when they had PCI or placebo. So people I hope aren't bored of Orbiter yet because they're going to hear a lot more from us in the coming well, years. I love that and uh, I want to congratulate you both. Thank you. Congratulations for this is uh, a New England Journal publication, first authorship, congratulations. Thank you very much. This is Thank fantastic. You, yep. you have quite a huge future. <laughs> but mostly to you Rasha for uh, leading the way on so many levels. Uh, you are um, not only an amazing mentor, but a clinician scientist that we all look up to. And congratulations for the work that you have done for our field of percutaneous coronary intervention and our better understanding of it and in helping patients, but most importantly for mentoring such <laughs> wonderful, uh, wonderful mentees. So congratulations. Thank you, Thank you Roxana. <coughs> Thank you for mentoring me so much over the years. <laughs> yeah.